imagine, if you will, a time some centuries from now. A time like that so often pictured in the post-apocalyptic movies and media of our present. Perhaps some ecological catastrophe has taken place, maybe 500 years earlier. Maybe we have scorched the sky, as described in the Matrix trilogy, or it could be that our experimentation with the genetic code has unleashed a virus that for a time turned most of humanity into shambling shells of themselves until weather and lack of prey have rendered most of them to dust. Whatever the scenario, all of civilization has collapsed. In place after place, the lights have blinked out. The infrastructure has decayed, and nature has, in many locations, taken back what had once been claimed by humans. And in our imaginary future, let us think that a fragment of humanity has survived the catastrophe by hiding in cave dwellings created a thousand years earlier by previous inhabitants of the region. They have waited out the inevitable carnage and chaos brought about by the collapse of the social contracts that keep our most predatory impulses at bay, and thus have avoided the worst of it all. By having a small footprint and asking of their environment only what they needed, they are able to eke out an existence until the crisis has passed and a new equilibrium has been established. Gone are the electronic networks and the devices they once served. No longer are there great pathways of light. Now there are simple but effective technologies, easy to build and maintain. Time is no longer kept by the clock, but instead by sun and moon and stars, rhythms remembered in poems and stories and songs shared from one generation to the next. In the dry climate, where organic things can last longer, a few records have been preserved and some knowledge retained, but for the community of a few thousand souls, what remains is a shadow of what once was. In time, perhaps a few hundred years, once a certain stability is attained, this small civilization might be able to venture forth from their protected enclave to explore what else might still be out there. They can gather artifacts and hope that they will be able to recover some of the lost information and thus make their lives easier, healthier, and longer. In time, they venture far to the south, past skeletal remains of the great ruined city named after the mythological bird. A few years later, as part of longer and longer journeys of exploration, they come across another great ruined city, much like the first, though a bit smaller. From there, seeking relief from the desert heat, they venture up a tall mountain and come across something they have never seen. Here, in the cooler and drier air, they find a complex better preserved than most. It is filled with buildings, many still domed, cavernous in their rusting and collapsing interiors. These stand at the edge of the irregular plateau that tops the mountain, offering views out over the desert that are stunning. At night, the stars wheel above the domes as if they were placed in the sky just to frame the structures. Also, in one place, there are a series of shafts piercing deep into the mountain. Down some of the shafts are rusting tracks like those sometimes found crossing the desert floor. These, however, lead to rooms deep under the earth. Many of the surface buildings, though, have even greater mysteries to offer. In some, there are giant U-shaped yokes, massive in size and construction, dwarfing the explorers. Lying near them are cracked and warped cylinders of glass, some impossibly thick, mirrored with silver, slowly corroding in the passage of time. In a few are collapsed gridworks, once connected to the glass at one end and giant cages on the other. Some of the domes are open to the sky, the perfect daytime blue and bejeweled night visible through the long, wide slit left ajar by the previous inhabitants. Some of the group tell stories of great wise men and women who once inhabited these hills, who received signals from the heavens and understood what they meant. But those people are long gone now, replaced by nesting birds and scurrying lizards. In these domed buildings, and others too, there are other rooms. Rectangular and functional, they are filled with tall racks of metal boxes, bolted to frames, silent and complex in their standing and attention. 
There are desks and consoles, with more boxes and cabinets filled with fragile papers that display unrecognizable writing and figures. Some of the figures are bizarre, filled with irregularly shaped contours. Others, however, seem very familiar. They show patterns the explorers recognize, the stars of the night sky. What is this place? How is it built? What does it tell about the society and civilization that produced it? Is it a holy and sacred space? Do people live here? If so, who were the residents of the dome city of Kitt Peak? And why did they build this place? Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 5.1, Supplemental, Mesoamerican Astronomy. When trying to understand any ancient culture, we are almost always faced with the types of questions asked at the end of our introduction. They help us create the context for the architecture and artifacts we find associated with the culture. They are the stock and trade of archaeologists and anthropologists as they undertake inquiry in their particular disciplines. When the ancient culture being studied is part of our cultural heritage, they have a better idea of how they might answer those questions. There is more context that has been passed down through the stories and customs, and usually the civilizations they are trying to reconstruct look familiar in many ways. If, however, the culture is completely foreign, such a reconstruction could be much harder to assemble. In these cases, it is often harder to piece together how everything fits, and there's always this danger of inserting assumptions relevant in other cultures that might be inappropriate or inaccurate into the broader picture for the particular culture that they are studying. Such is the difficulty we face when we look to study the great civilizations of Central and South America. While Western civilization has a historical thread that ties back to the cultural traditions of Egypt and Mesopotamia, such a connection is almost always lacking when attempting to examine the complex cultures and societies that inhabited the regions of Central Mexico, the Yucatan, Guatemala and Honduras, and the western coasts of South America, from Chile in the south to Costa Rica in the north, centered on Peru. These peoples, originating from northeastern Asia 10 to 20,000 years ago, left behind the world of their ancestors to forge societies and civilizations shaped by the mountains and jungles of a very different environment. And while we do have the artifacts and cities of those cultures, and in some cases, when saved by the Spanish conquistadors, the writings and stories, we are often left to try and puzzle out how it all fit together. In fact, until recently, we have been broadly ignorant of the scale and sophistication of the cultures. Only with the advent of orbital GIS systems, with their ability to photograph the ground in many wavelengths, have we begun to understand truly the massive scale and complexities of these once great empires that have been swallowed by the tropical climate and ecosystem or rendered inaccessible by the ruggedness of the high mountain terrain. As we have begun to uncover the true grandeur of these advanced societies, we are only now beginning to appreciate just how amazing they were. And yet, even as we begin to do this, as we begin to appreciate the scale and accomplishments of these peoples, we are still left struggling to understand what much of what they left behind actually means. This is especially true in the architecture of their great public buildings. As with the Egyptians, we know that they serve something of a public purpose for a ruling class, but we don't always know or understand all of the thinking that went into creating the structures, nor the full significance or purpose of their construction. 
just as our imaginary survivors of a modern apocalypse would be baffled and perplexed by the ruins of the National Astronomical Observatory at Kitt Peak just outside Tucson, Arizona, such is the case for those who seek to understand the great cities and cultures of the Maya, Inca, and Aztec, not to mention the other diverse peoples of the regions of Mesoamerica and South America. Fortunately, though, great progress has been made over the last century in understanding these cultures, in no small part due to understanding the astronomical ideas that they held. As has been the case in each of the other cultures we have looked at, the sky ties together many of the important aspects of the civilizations, so that by understanding how each viewed the heavens above them, we gain invaluable insight into how that picture both represented and informed the culture. In the realms of religion, timekeeping, cosmology, and status, the conceptualization of the sky and its motions, both day and night, provide a powerful window into the minds and lives of the people of these great civilizations. The difficulty with trying to cover this topic, however, is that there's just so much territory in history to examine. So to try to simplify this to some degree, I'm going to take an approach that is centered first on the most influential of the Mesoamerican cultures, that of the Maya peoples, and then build from there to the other great Mexican civilization, the Aztecs. In a later episode, we'll then travel further south to Peru to look at the astronomical traditions of the Inca and a few of the best understood tribal peoples of the Amazon River Basin. So, as always in these episodes, let me give my usual caveat and or disclaimer. This is but a single episode that will serve only as an introduction to some of the aspects of pre-Columbian Mesoamerican astronomy. By the way, how's that for a string of limiters and qualifiers? I will in no way begin to cover the breadth and depth of these amazing civilizations, even in their astronomical knowledge. For those who are interested in going deeper, let me recommend a few resources. A pair of the best books on pre-Columbian civilization are 1491 and 1493 by Charles C. Mann. I think these do a nice job of providing an overview of the scholarship to date in a very broad sense. In the realm of archaeoastronomy, let me remind you of E.C. Krupp's book, Echoes of Ancient Skies, and also tell you about a fine textbook published by Springer written by Brian Penpraise of Pomona College titled The Power of Stars, How Celestial Observations Shape Civilization. This second book covers a lot of ground, but it does a nice job of looking at the subject matter topically and then by culture. It is really well organized and would be a great resource for anyone wanting to dig in a bit, not just on this specific topic, but in comparing and contrasting across the vastness of human experience. Finally, let me direct you to a fairly new Aztec podcast by Carlos Miranda. As far as I know, it's the only show solely dedicated to looking at this culture, so it's worth a listen if you'd like to learn more. There's one additional thing we need to take a few moments to discuss that is of some importance in looking at many of these cultures. So far in this series, we've looked at civilizations whose entire existence has not only been north of the equator, but, in most cases, north of the 23rd parallel, also known as the Tropic of Cancer. The reason this is important is that for those peoples, the sun would never have reached the zenith, that point directly overhead, in its path across the sky, even on the longest day of the year in June. For the civilizations we'll be discussing in this episode, they will be predominantly located between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, or, to place this in more numerical terms, the lines of latitude that are 23 degrees north and south of the equator, respectively. What this means is that on two days of the year, the sun does reach the zenith, and for those peoples living north of the equator, the summer days between those two zenith passing days will actually have the sun pass through the northern part of the sky on its path from rising in the northeast and setting in the northwest. This will factor into the important astronomical dates of various places and structures as we move forward. So with the caveat stated and the sources cited, let's look at the Maya and their amazingly complex astronomical tradition and calendar.
When talking about the Maya, I have a confession to make. Before doing the research for this episode, I was under the profoundly mistaken impression that it was an empire, much like the Roman or Persian empires that are its historical contemporaries. A much more accurate picture is that the Maya, prior to the arrival of the Spanish, were a people with a shared language and cultural heritage, but with a less structured and more fractured political system. The more apt comparison would be to look at the Greek city-states of their classical period with competing alliances and dominant cities all vying for influence and supremacy. Maya civilization will initially come to prominence in 2500 BCE in the region of Mesoamerica centered on the Yucatan Peninsula and the Guatemalan highlands, and will remain dominant both politically and culturally until being conquered, though never completely assimilated, by the Spanish. However, given the longevity of the civilization and the seemingly inherent stability in political structure, there were many ebbs and flows in the political fortunes of the various city-states and allied confederations, with cities and regions rising up and then being abandoned many times over the centuries. What remained fairly constant, however, was the cultural heritage of the people. Nothing more symbolizes this than the Mayan calendar, and it is so at this point that we will start. Of all the astronomical things I've run across so far in my survey of ancient astronomy, this has got to be the most intriguing. Unlike most systems of timekeeping we've discussed, the Mayan system seems to have not involved the moon in any way. Instead, there were two calendars, one religious and the other agricultural, that were based on two different scales based around a single number. Just like our civilization is based on decimal number systems, centered on the number 10, and the Babylonians had a number system based on the number 60, of course. The Mayans also had a base for their number system, in this case, 20. Anthropologists do not know exactly why this number was chosen, but it seems most likely that the explanation corresponds to the number of fingers and toes we all have. This number base is common in Mesoamerican cultures, evidence of either the broad reach of Maya culture or some sort of a common ancestor culture. This number system also features a characteristic that wouldn't be independently invented in the classical civilizations of Europe and the Middle East until much, much later, the concept and representation of the number zero. Let's begin with the sacred or religious calendar known as the Zulkin, or literally, the Count of Days. The Zulkin was a calendar based on 13 cycles of 20 kin, or days. Each day was given a name, something like Imix or Ik, and each cycle, or Yunal, was given a number. What's very different here was how the days were counted off. In the modern Western calendar, we have months and then days within that month. So when we go through the days, we start with the first day of the month and count all the way to the 30th day of the month before moving to the next month. That's not really the way the Mayan calendar worked. The way you counted through the 260 total days of the calendar was as follows. You'd start with one I mix, and then the next day would be two ik, and then three akabal, and etc. until you got to the 13th number. Then you would cycle back to the one in the number, but continue to the 14th day name, X. To give you a better sense of this, if we counted our days like this now, we would start with January 1st, then February 2nd, then March 3rd, until we got to December 12th. The next day would then be January 13th, then February 14th, and so long. One visualization of this I've seen is to imagine two interlocking gears, one with 13 teeth and the other with 20, each tooth on each wheel having the appropriate name. As they turn in unison, with each gear advancing one tooth per day, that gives you how the day names work. This means that there will be 260 different unique combinations of numbers and day names before things start to repeat. As strange as this may seem to us now, it's actually a reasonable way to number the days, and there's one version of an ancient Chinese calendar that uses a somewhat similar method. What makes the calendar unique is the 260-day time frame. 
This is not in any way related to any obvious astronomical time scale we find elsewhere in the world. So where does it come from? Anthropologists and astronomers have suggested several possible explanations. Astronomers note that 260 days is very close to the amount of time Venus is either a morning or an evening star, and that this is also the period between days when the Sun would have been at the zenith for much of the region during what is known as the Maya Classical Period. Anthropologists have suggested that this period is also very close to the planting to harvest time for maize, as well as a close approximation of the time of human gestation. My hypothesis, and please note that this is only that, is that these cycles reinforced each other in the cultural mind of the Maya people. As many have noted, the human mind is adept at finding patterns, even in unrelated phenomena. And it is certainly possible that as the Maya observed important natural phenomena such as childbirth and agricultural cycles as being similar in length, this period would have taken on great importance. Once the motion of Venus was observed to have a corresponding time of positional relation to the Sun, i.e. either being a morning or evening star, it seems to me that it would have been a natural thing to project the more immediate earthly cycles on it into the heavens. Indeed, while we find little evidence of a special place for Venus in early Maya cities, later ones such as Chichen Itza do seem to have buildings with features aligned with the motions of Venus in the heavens. We'll talk about Venus in much greater depth shortly. Finally, at around the time of the founding of the city of Palenque in 565 CE, it would have also been known that the amount of time from the late summer date of the sun being at zenith to the next early summer date was around 260 days. As each of these numbers reinforced each other, the culture would have more profoundly come to believe that this number was deeply woven into the very fabric and structure of the world and its foundations. The other calendar used by the Maya is known as the Hab, or Modified Solar Calendar. It is structured and counted similarly to the Zulkin, except that it has 18 numbers and 20 day names which are different, by the way, than the Zulkin day names. This pattern of 18 times 20 gives 360 days, and so, like the Egyptians, they added five additional days to bring the calendar in line with the solar year. These days, called the Wayeb, were thought to be very bad days, where the boundary between the living and dead and the natural and supernatural was thought to be very thin. During this time, people would take precautions to avoid disasters such as not leaving their homes or brushing their hair. While this calendar does approximate the solar year, it does not take into account the extra quarter of a day and so, over the course of time, the months drifted through the seasons, something the Maya were aware of and willing to accept. The combination of the two calendars, the Zulkin and the Hab, resulted in what is known as the calendar round. As you might imagine, it was necessary to keep track of the Zulkin day for religious purposes and the Hob day for the agricultural ones. Thus, each day was named according to both. For example, four men, six pak. This interwoven cycle of 260 day Zulkin years and 365 day Hob years would find a lowest common denominator in 18,980 days or kin. This corresponds to 52 cycles through the Hob, or 73 cycles through the Zulkin, something known as the calendar round. Because of the way the interweaving takes place, not every single combination of the two days in each calendar can occur, and thus there are only four Zulkin days that the Hob New Year can take place on. These four days are known as the year bearers, and each was associated with an important religious figure in the Mayan creation narrative and associated cosmological picture of the world. The turning over of the calendar round in its 52 year cycles was an event of significant importance to the Maya, as that they were always afraid that the world would come to a stop at this point of transition and restarting. As such, there were a number of ritual ceremonies that were conducted to ensure the continuation of time, including an observation of the Pleiades to make sure that they continued in their motion through the night sky, 
an event that, once confirmed, led to a ceremonial lighting of a new fire to kindle the new calendar round cycle. To go to longer time scales, the Maya would use multiples of 20 hob to count periods analogous to our decades, centuries, and millennia. The period of one cycle through the hob, lacking the extra five days, was known as a tune, which was made up of 360 kin, or days. 20 tune was known as a ka tune, and 20 ka tune was known as a bak tune, a length of time that corresponded to about 390 solar years. By recording a date in reference to each of these time periods, the culture created what is commonly known as the long count calendar, with each day being indicated by a total of five numbers. Now, if you think about it, we do the same sort of thing with our decimal calendar. Take the date I'm writing this episode on it, for example. If the date is February 18th, 2016, what I'm really saying is that it has been two 1,000 year intervals, plus zero 100 year intervals, plus one 10 year interval, plus six one year intervals since a commonly understood marker date, usually thought to be the year of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, though there's some considerable debate about that. We then locate the specific day within the year by stating the month name, February, and then the day of that month, the 18th. The Mayan dating system did exactly the same thing but from within their framework of a mostly base 20 system. By adding up the days indicated by the numbers in the base 20 system, a Maya astronomer could precisely date an event from an origin date held to be the beginning of the universe, which in the Western Gregorian calendar corresponds to about 3115 BCE. One additional consideration is that in this long count calendar, it was thought that when the Bakhtun date number rolled from 12 to 13, one age ended and a new age began. If one does the math, this works out to be nearly 5,200 years, with the most recent specific date of roller thought to have been, at least by some, December 23, 2012 in the Gregorian calendar. I say by some because there's a good bit of scholarly debate as to exactly how to correlate the two calendars and how to count the days. Nevertheless, you may recall a little bit of excitement by some who suggested, based on a misinterpretation of Maya religion, that the world would come to an end. I believe there was even a very bad movie starring Nicolas Cage centered around the idea. Of course, to be fair, I seem to recall a much greater wave of hysteria regarding the year 2000 rollover in the Gregorian system and the possible end of ages. It should be noted also that there are longer multiples of 20 in the calendar system indicating that Maya astronomer priests were certainly well able to think in terms of longer time frames. I have not yet been able to ascertain why the rollover from 12 to 13 in the long count calendar would have been especially significant, but we do know that it was thought to be the end of an age sort of an event with a resetting of the world in some fashion. So a question one may ask is why is it that the Maya calendar was so intricate with the large number of moving parts and vast scales? The answer to this question has to do with Maya cosmology and the culture's view of humanity's place and role within that larger framework. When talking about this topic, it is important to recognize that while there is a broad common culture among the Maya peoples, there are important distinctions between the clans and cities of the upper highland regions of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Chiapas, known as the Quiche Maya, and those of the lowland regions of the Yucatan and Honduras. The view of the Quiche Maya has been preserved in a work known in English as the Book of the Jaguar Priest. Before recounting the worldview of this compilation of narratives describing the cosmos, it should be noted that within the title of the work is an important connection to the sky. In many Mesoamerican stories, the jaguar is an important symbol of the night nice sky, often associated with the Big Dipper. The spotted coat of the great cat was thought to represent the stars spread across the sky, 
much in the same way that the coat of the leopard was seen to the Egyptians. The creation of the world, its history before the present age, and the structure of the cosmos are all recounted in the book of the Jaguar Priest. In it, the earth comes into being through the action of a plumed serpent who rises from the primordial sea and along with a god known as Heart of the Sky and Huracan, a weather god, creates the earth and the two invisible realms that surround it, a 13-layer overworld ruled by 13 gods and a 9-layer underworld ruled by 9 lords. It is in this underworld that two twin boys will play a deadly game of Maya football, something that is much like modern day soccer, in order to resurrect their slain father. In their success, the father will become the maze god while they will ascend to become the sun and the moon. Through the ages of creation, there will be four creations of living beings. The first will be animals that lacking speech are unable to pray to the gods and are thus banished to the jungles. The second will be a race of clay figures who are not able to withstand the rains of Urkhan and thus melt. The third are a people made of wood who are eventually mostly destroyed, with the remnant becoming monkeys. And finally, there is the creation of humanity. To avoid suffering the same fate as the other creations, humans are to keep close track of the time and ways of the gods so as to offer the appropriate prayers and sacrifices. This sacred imperative of good timekeeping thus becomes the impetus of the calendric system. In time, the figure of the plumed serpent, seen as the creator god, will become known as the Quetzal serpent due to an association with the brightly colored Quetzal bird. This will continue to evolve until the serpent is known as Quetzalcoatl, the prime deity of the Maya religion during its classical period. He, along with one of the two twin boy soccer players, will become associated with Venus, thus leading to the primary importance of this celestial object and its 260 per day period of visibility in the Zulkan calendar. There is a great deal more one can say about Maya religious practices, but in the interest of keeping the length of this episode manageable, I'll refer you to the sources I mentioned earlier if you'd like to get a more complete picture. Like all advanced civilizations, the Maya incorporated astronomical significance into the buildings and monuments of their great cities. The most famous example of this, of course, is found in the post-classical period city in the northern Yucatan known as Chichen Itza. In this cultural center, there are two buildings of specific significance. The first is known as the Caracol, or Snail, so-called due to a spiral staircase found within the main structure of the building. When Chichen Itza was first rediscovered by an American and a British explorer in 1842, the building was initially thought to have been a dome structure due to the cylindrical shape of the main building, the internal spiral staircase, and the deteriorated state of an upper part of the main tower. A later explorer associated with Minan Observatory due to this assumption and the presumed parallels with the domed observatories being built in Europe and the United States at the time. It was not until later that the true architectural design of the building was more properly understood. We'll post a picture of the structure as well as a diagram of its layout on our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. But for those who are listening to this in an environment where pulling up a web page is not practical, let me offer a description of sorts. Constructed of white stone, the caracol looks something like a two-layer wedding cake sitting on top of two rectangular-ish boxes, the bottom one being about twice as large as the upper platform. On the west-facing sides of the rectangular bases, there are grand staircases ascending to the central two-level tower. The lower tower is bigger around and is in better condition than the upper tower, which is now mostly rubble. The top of the lower cylinder would have served as a platform for someone to stand upon in order to look over the surrounding jungle canopy, 
assuming such a thing existed at the time of the city's occupation, as it may have been that the land would have been cleared for cultivation or additional living space. The upper tower would not have likely been topped with a dome, but rather terminated in another flat surface, perhaps used as an observing platform or a lookout. The building displays a mix of Maya and Toltec architectural and artistic elements, likely displaying an evolution in Mayan culture as it moved northward in what is known as the Mayan Late Classical Period. The purpose of the caracol was debated for a number of years, with the two main camps being that it was either an astronomical observatory or a military lookout installation of some sort. While it may have served a dual purpose, evidence has come to light strongly suggesting its use in the former capacity. The first attempts to determine the astronomical functions of the tower were made by archaeologist Oliver Ricketson in 1925. He was able to establish that by sighting using the inner and outer jams of one of the windows of the upper tower, a person could establish the fall and spring equinox setting positions of the sun with fairly high accuracy. He also claimed that the other windows could be used to sight lunar rising and setting positions. A comprehensive follow-up survey was conducted in 1935 that while confirming the solar alignment cast doubt on the lunar ones. Work done in 1975 by Anthony F. Avini and Horst Hartung was able to suggest another alternative, one much more in line with the function of the Mayan calendar and the practice of their religion. Avini and Hartung, in an article published in Science, established that the windows are more likely aligned for specific observations to be made of Venus's points of maximum elongation. Their work also called into question the solar alignment of Rickinson's Window 1, as it is called. Because of this, they explored other options and found a much more likely scenario. The center of the window aligns with the setting position of the sun on the two days where the sun passes through the zenith. From these and other pieces of evidence, it seems likely that the caracol was used as an observatory, but that its main focus may have been centered on the motions of Venus rather than the sun and the moon, as was the case in many other Native American cultures. The key thing to understand here is that number of 260 seems to be built into the actual architecture and structure of the building itself. If this is the case, as seems likely, let's take a moment to talk about Venus's motion and why they might have been so important to the Maya people. As you may recall from our episode on the planets, Venus remains fairly close to the sun in the sky no more than about 45 degrees at what we call maximum elongation. It is also the third brightest object in the heavens after the sun and the moon. The way the motion can be thought of is that when Venus is first seen in the morning sky before sunrise, that marks the beginning of the cycle. The planet will then get further away from the sun for a while, reach maximum elongation, and then move closer back towards the sun. This takes 263 days to occur, which, as we've already pointed out, is very close to both the planting to harvesting time for maize, the staple of Mesoamerican cereal crop, the gestation time for a pregnant woman, and the time between two successive zenith crossings of the sun. Venus then disappears in the vicinity of the sun for 50 days, unobservable due to the sun's glare. After this, it is an evening star setting after the sun on the western horizon for another 263 days, going through the same motions as it did as a morning object or star. Finally, it disappears into the glare of the sun again for another 50 days before re-emerging once again as a morning object, thus completing the cycle. This total amount of time, what the astronomers call the planet's synodic period, is a total of 584 days. If you take 584 and multiply it by 5, you get 2920 days. Take this number and divide it by the 365-day Hob year, and you arrive at almost exactly 8. In other words, Venus will go through 5 cycles in its motion every 8 agricultural years. While this may seem like a bit of a stretch, recall the Mayan calendar round that was able to sync the 260-day Zulkin and 365-day Hob on a 52-year cycle. For a culture able to tell time with such precision, the 5 to 8 Venus cycle resonance, as it were, would not have been a problem. 
as the upper portion of the caracal also seemed to incorporate the ability to sight the setting and presumably when the upper tower was still complete, the rising position of the sun on the zenith crossing dates, it's pretty clear that the upper portion of the structure was a tower dedicated to observing this 260 day cycle. What is just as fascinating, at least to me, is that the base also seems to serve a more traditional set of observational functions. The large base rectangle is aligned with the setting position of the sun on the summer solstice. The second rectangle on top of that is not built as a true rectangle as the angles of intersection of the walls are not actually 90 degrees and the sides aren't parallel. However, the corners of this structure, along with the windows of the lower tower, seem to align with various heliacal stellar rising points and more importantly, the rising and setting positions of the sun on the solstice dates. In addition, the stairways leading up to each foundational piece consist of 13 and 18 steps that, as we have seen, correspond to the number of 20-day periods in each of the Mayan calendrical systems. In short, the entire structure, as was often the case with many monumental constructions, seems to be something of a physical embodiment of the various Mayan calendrical systems, as is consistent with the religious narrative that sets humanity apart from the other animals by its ability to mark out the days and thus pay proper honor and respect to both the age and the gods. Finally, as E.C. Krupp points out, if this had been an observatory, which is the most likely conclusion given the evidence. There would have been all sorts of other additional smaller pieces of equipment used in the astronomical work of those who would have occupied the observatory. Just like most of the upper tower of the Caracal itself, these pieces are lost to us now, and so, like the explorers in our introduction, who were left to deduce the one-time function of the Mayall telescope at Kitt Peak using only the largest disconnected fragments, so too were we left to try to understand the caracal at Chichen Itza based on fragmentary evidence. The other building at Chichen Itza of some interest to us is what is known as El Castillo or the Temple of Kulkulkan. Again, we'll post a picture at the website, but this is a classical Mayan step pyramid with the usual impossibly or nearly so steep stairs. The front of the steps of this pyramid face the sunrise position of the summer solstice. Additionally, on the two equinox dates, as the sun rises, the stairs, raised as they are from the face of the pyramid, cast a shadow that seems to slither snake-like down the face of the step structure in an apparent homage to Quetzalcoatl, another name for Kulkakan, the serpent creator god associated with Venus as we discussed before. Mayan symbolic architecture was, of course, not just limited to Chichen Itza. One other architectural construction I'd like to point out is something less often discussed in these surveys, but one that brings together the astronomical, religious, and architectural aspects of the Maya. In the city of Palenque in Chiapas, there's a building known as the Temple of Inscriptions. A stepped pyramid topped with a ceremonial building it was thought for a very long time to be a structure dedicated to performing just the rituals associated with Maya culture and religion. This view, however, was expanded in 1949 when Alberto Ruiz lifted a large stone slab in the floor of the upper ceremonial building and discovered a stairway leading into the pyramid below. After four years of excavation, he was able to descend the 66 steps to a large vaulted crypt containing the sarcophagus of Lord Pakal, or shield. From the inscriptions on the coffin as well as on the walls, it has been learned that Pakal was the king of the city until his death in 1683 CE, and had been interred there by his son and successor. On the lid of the sarcophagus is a carving of a man entering into a gaping hole. I'll post a diagram of this to the website as it might be helpful in understanding the story, but also for the reason that I find it to just be a, a stunningly beautiful example of the artistic skill of the Maya stonecutters. Eric von Danken, in his book Chariots of Fire, claimed that this was an image of an astronaut entering the black void of space, something he claimed supported his dubious hypothesis that the Earth had been visited multiple times by a race of extraterrestrials. To counter this point of view, 
Dr. Linda Schella, professor of art history, has convincingly argued from other pieces of Maya art and writing that the figure is, in fact, the king himself, following the dying sun into the underworld. This view is supported by the positioning of the temple itself, which is aligned in such a way that the path of the setting sun on the date of the winter solstice follows the path suggested on the lid of the sarcophagus and enacted in the angle of the stairs from the ceremonial building into the heart of the pyramid itself. To understand this, you have to imagine yourself standing in front of the temple of inscriptions as the sun sets behind it on the winter solstice day, held to be the day the sun dies in Maya religion. In your mind's eye, the sun would enter the top of the pyramid, travel down the interior stairs, and then pass through the lid of the sarcophagus itself into the underworld. If you've been listening to this series of episodes, you already understand the death metaphor found here on the shortest day of the year. Additionally, on that day, the last light of the setting sun hits the face of another temple in the complex, called the Temple of the Cross. It strikes that temple on a relief carving commemorating the transfer of power from father to son. In the relief, the son, one Cham Balam, stands next to the smaller figure of his father, who is holding in his hand the head of the son. In another part of the relief, Cham Balam is seen offering the head of the son inverted to one of the gods of the underworld, a god that we call God El. As the last light of the sun crosses the relief, it pools at the foot of this god before it fades away. A sacrificial offering from the new kingdom to the gods of the underworld to ensure rule safe from calamity. At the time Maya civilization was beginning its ascent, there was another city that had already achieved greatness, Teotihuacan. We don't know who built this massive urban complex, but indications are that by 500 CE it housed over 200,000 people, making it one of the most populous cities on earth, comparable to Rome at the time. Like their neighbors to the south, the people of Teotihuacan were pyramid builders, with over 600 pyramids being part of the city in various complexes. The largest of these is known as the Temple of the Sun, a name given to it by later Aztec chroniclers. It was accompanied by the Temple of the Moon and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. None of these names, however, are actually indicative of the functions of the temples, something which is broadly unknown due to a lack of writing from the time period. One thing we do know, however, is that the city was laid out on a regular grid pattern with an almost obsessive dedication. What is a mystery, though, is that what the grid might be aligned to. It does not seem to line up with any of the common things, like the sunrise or sunset on an astronomically important day. The most promising hypothesis is that the more east-west axis of the grid would have aligned with the heliacal rising position of the Pleiades at the time of the construction of the largest pieces, sometime around 150 CE. In time, this civilization that had so dominated the highlands of the central Mexico would completely collapse and be replaced first by the Toltec Empire and then, later, the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs were a people who had migrated from further north into central Mexico by the 13th century CE, and after being muscled around by the local tribes, were forced onto the main island of Lake Tecaco. There they established a place of residence and moved to conquer all around them through either warfare or diplomacy. While they brought much of their own religious practice with them, it is also clear that they shared a great deal with the Maya civilization to the south, most importantly, the calendar. The great Aztec city of Tenochtitlan was constructed on the island. The great pyramid temple of the central plaza was constructed so that when the sun rose behind it on the day of the equinox, it would pass between the two great towers constructed on the top of the pyramid and bathe the gathered spectators in the courtyard below in its first light. This alignment was deeply rooted in the religious beliefs of the Aztec people who thought that they were descended from a warrior king god 
who was associated with the sun. Born of the moon and brother to the stars, he vanquishes them all when they act to try and stop his birth. For those who are interested in Aztec religion, I would recommend checking out the books by Krupp and Pen Praise as they do a nice job of fleshing out what we know about the Mexica as they call it themselves. This brings us to the close of this episode. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, we'll post pictures and diagrams of a number of the objects and structures we've mentioned in the episode. I hope that through this narration, I've conveyed just a fraction of the wonder and awe I've experienced in doing the research for what you've just heard. Over and over again, I have found myself admiring the cleverness, ingenuity, and artistic creativity of the peoples of Mesoamerica as they integrated their religious imperative to count and track the days into so many aspects of their lives. Perhaps you will find this interesting enough to go and do a little research of these cultures on your own. I promise that if you take a bit of time to become familiar with the forms of expression found in the art and architecture of the Maya, you'll find yourself swept into their complex and compelling history and culture. In a way of a bit of podcast business, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a huge surge in the number of downloads and people listening to our show. If you're fairly new to the podcast, welcome aboard the Odyssey. Be sure to check out the website and our Facebook page. Drop us a note and say hi and become an active member of the crew. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us those too. Also, if you can, leave us a review on whatever service you're listening to us on. On that topic, by the way, we'd like to do a bit of an experiment if you think you might be able to help us out. We're trying to figure out what it would take to get us into the top 200 list on iTunes, at least in the category of higher education where this podcast is listed. Presently, we're not ranked, but there are a number of podcasts that have sort of been pod faded for over like five years. So we'd like to see if we can get 10 more reviews and that might move us above some of those on the list. Right now, we have about 250 people a week who are downloading the latest episode. If just 4% of you leave us a strong review on iTunes, we could test our hypothesis out. Do you think you can help us out with this? We'd really, really appreciate it. For those of you listening out on Stitcher, TuneIn, or some other service, a few reviews there will also help us to get the word out so others who might be interested could find out that we actually exist. Also, if you're enjoying the content, share us with your neighbors, your friends, classmates, coworkers, whoever you think might be interested. There's always room for another member of the crew. And finally, if you've been enjoying the music of the show, be sure to head over to the website of the Blue Dot Sessions at www.sessions.blue to hear more of their fantastic compositions. Next week, we'll return to the narrative of Western civilization's journey to finding its place in the cosmos by looking at the Greeks and the geometer's universe. Until next time... Full sails on your journey.